Well, the sermon this week is you can't take it with us. Now, as somebody who is fully packed in his car, who has his sister's car fully packed, both my sister and my mother would tell you, I'm doing my best to try to bring it with us. But as we look at our lives, we kind of know the saying, right? It's a reminder that no matter how much and what you do in your life, in the end, what's going to happen to each of us? We're going to die. And you can't take it with you. I mean, that's the old adage. In fact, our gospel message is like, that's what it says, right? I could end the sermon right now and simply tell you this. We all screw up. Yet God has taken things in control and made it right for us. So it's our job to go tell people about him. And we should be using what we have to do it. And if you don't, what are you? A fool. Amen. Now, that's a sermon. But we like to read through this story and take the chuckles right now about how, you know, oh yeah, we should do this. But what's the hard issue here? Why do we struggle with the idea of having as much as we can, taking what God has given us to share it and not be a fool? Well, in order to do this, I have a couple of things for us to think about as we examine this story. Things in our own life to help us figure out what we've been dealing with. The first one I have to ask is, do we care about he who gives us blessings? Or do we care more about the blessings he's given us? What I'm asking about this is to think about all the different things in your life. Do you thank God for it? Or do you do what you can to get more of it? Do you sacrifice some of your blessings in order to get more of something? And if you do, here's my next question. Who benefits from your sacrifice? Whatever you do to get something, who really is the one who gets to you know, enjoy it? We'll get to that. And lastly, the reason why we're doing this is because if you start asking these questions, you start to determine your identity, who you see yourself as. Now, to give you an example of this, let's go back to ancient Egypt. What are those? The pyramids. The pyramids serve two purposes, well, three, but the two main ones is they were a tomb for Pharaoh, and they were a storehouse of all the blessings of Egypt. Pharaoh wanted to have those blessings for the afterlife. So he took the rich country of Egypt of all of its blessings and sacrificed a whole bunch of money, people, and very gifts of Egypt to build these things to store it for himself. He was, bene- he was one to benefit from it. And who did Pharaoh see himself as? As a god. But as we look at this example of how we can handle our blessings, it has a storehouse. What about our own lives? What kind of blessings do you have? Do you have a place to sleep? A job? A spouse? Children? Good health? Each of us are given different blessings, some more than others. But these blessings can be either really good to help us care for God, or we can start to be so focused on keeping those blessings. So much so, so much so that we would sacrifice some of them to gain others. Maybe it's that job of yours. They have to spend more time at the office, make more sales in order to make more money. Well, who ends up getting sacrificed in that situation? Your spouse and maybe your children. And the scary thing is you'll tell yourself, I'm doing this for them. I'm working hard for them. Nah. It's about you. And if that's the case, what's your identity? Who's the one in charge? Who's the one that you care most about then? It's yourself. And there's a real big danger when that happens. And that is what Jesus is truly addressing in our gospel reading today. So let's take a little road trip. We see we're in Luke chapter 12. Last week, Pastor talked about the Lord's Prayer. Meanwhile, God, I mean Jesus, well, Jesus and God, and the disciples are headed down to Jerusalem. 
Because Jesus has to do this thing called a crucifixion. So meanwhile, him and disciples are meeting with people and teaching back and forth. Now this is two chapters after when Pastor uh, Scott talked about. The reason why is, in Luke 11, Jesus spends a lot of time rebuking Pharisees and scribes. Warning the people to not listen to them because they're hypocrites. Now I have to ask, today, who are the Pharisees and the scribes? It's the vicar. It's the pastors. I wonder why we don't read that section. But here it is, Jesus warning the people, stay away from the hypocrites, the teachers. Well, some gentleman in the group decides to raise his hand. Teacher, tell my brother to split our inheritance. This individual is hearing Jesus talk about, hey, don't listen to the teachers of the law. They don't know what they're talking about. And thinking to himself, well, you're teaching. All right, what do you think I should do? You're a teacher, a rabbi, someone I should go to. Jesus responds twofold to what he has to say. First thing is, what do you think I am? A judge? An arbiter? To make these type of decisions between you? What Jesus is kind of calling out for this gentleman is that I'm no scribe or Pharisee. I'm not somebody you appoint to deal with these small things. There's more important things out there that I'm teaching about, that I will judge about. People often talk about Jesus as a great teacher. This guy just called him out as a great teacher. And what does Jesus do? You have no idea who I am. I am no teacher. There's something more to me. So much so, this question you're asking, I will answer it. But at the heart of the matter. And what does he warn him? Guard your sense, yourself against greed. For life does not coexist in an abundance of possessions. The fact that you have to ask me, teacher, about this problem with your family... It sounds like that's the most important thing in your life that you care about most is to deal with this inheritance. Myself being in a situation in a family right now who are split over inheritance, who are fighting amongst themselves, greed really does split a family apart. Greed tears apart sisters that at one point love and care, each, care about each other because of this abundance of possessions. Now, to make his point come across, Jesus now tells a parable about an abundance of possessions. Up here is our gospel reading. This is the parable of the, of the foolish rich man. And in here, we read about this guy who gets a whole bunch of land, who wants to build up, because you want to store it. But unfortunately, God calls him out at the end. Now, we've been talking about these three different ways to look at how we make decisions in our life, how we identify ourselves. Let's do that. When we look at the text, we have to ask ourselves, what kind of blessings does he have? Well, the first thing we know this. He owns land. And in Kansas, is that a blessing to own land, to have your own land? Yeah. And he's rich. So right off the bat, this guy has a couple of blessings from God as it is. But that's not the blessing we have to deal with there. The blessing is what? An abundant harvest. A surplus of grain. Plenty of grain. This individual is getting like an, an extra bonus. And the question is, is what's he going to do with it? What decisions are he gonna, is he going to make based off of this blessing? Well, he decides to make a sacrifice for himself. But what's that sacrifice to do? He does it so he can tear down his old barns to build bigger ones. And who's this sacrifice for? Well, we look up there, I shall do, I will do, I will store to myself. This entire time, his entire thinking is about serving himself with this blessing. The reason why this is important to share is verse 19. Because what it really says to my soul, soul, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. 
his innermost being, uh, being his psyche, what matters most, our inter- what's internal to all of us. That's what he cares about, is having this grain for him. Right here, that's what matters. So much so, so much so, this verse ends with him being what? So he can drink, eat, and be merry. He's the God in his own universe. Because of all the blessings, he looks around and says, this is who I am. Well, things change. God says, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Guess what? God's going to take him away from all of his blessings. They will be removed from him, and now he's before God with nothing. He is before his creator, his maker, and he's got nothing to show for it. So who are you when you go to God and you have nothing? You're a fool. Our Old Testament reading, which Solomon writes, really picks up on this. Solomon is the king of Israel. Now we think of him as, you know, having all this wealth and great power, making Israel really big. A lot of it's a lie. And Solomon is here in his elder age looking over everything that's happened and realizing, I don't have a penny to show for it. We know this because once he dies, the country splits apart. He is so upset of what has happened, he realizes that all of his toils are what? Meaningless. And those who like the King James? Vanity. But when he uses the word vanity, when he says meaningless, what he's picturing is a vapor, a cloud of mist. You can see it, but if you try to grab it, there's no substance. There's nothing there. And Solomon realizes with all these things he's done, all the money he's made, all the different temples, all the over 1,000 women in his, in, his wife, in his life, it's meaningless. It's nothing. Yeah, over a thousand. Yeah. Well, besides what Jesus is pointing out, how it's meaningless with all these, to store all these blessings, besides Solomon bringing up the meaningless of having, trying to have all these built up, we have some modern day philosophers that share and tell that same story. And I can't help myself being in the state of Kansas to look to the group Kansas for their thoughts. For what do they say? Dust in a wind. All we are is dust in a wind. If you listen through their entire song, it sounds exactly like a reading from Ecclesiastes. That in the end, no matter what happens, all we are is a bunch of dust floating in the wind. So I ask you, those blessings that you have in your life, those ones that you care about, those ones that determine who you are, Maybe you're the great teacher, the worker, the caretaker. That's what you hold most to. Maybe it's you're the best parent ever. What happens when that blessing is taken away from you? What happens when it floats away like a dust in the wind? You're left with what? Nothing. And if you're left with nothing, that what makes you a fool. Now, this story that we talk about and share about Jesus, this salvation story, you can call it many different things, but one thing it is, is God dealing with our identity crisis. Because from the very beginning, we said it is about us. Not realizing how meaningless it is to say such a thing. Yet God called a man, his name was Abraham. You know what he told him? That he would be a blessing to the nations. Not just that he would receive blessings, that he himself would be a blessing. And from him, he called a group to be his people. He gave them identity. He showed them that it was all about him. Yet time and time again, what happens? We all rebel. We all, like to make a, we all like to make the point, it's all about us. Did he leave us there to be fools? No. 
Because he came down to be with us, to live with us. As we read here, teach to us. And in Luke 12, he was looking forward to, unfortunately, to the cross. But on that cross, Christ take, Jesus takes up all that is meaningless upon himself. On that cross that he's traveling to, he's taking on all the things that we have in our lives in order to give us meaning. If you are somebody who says you believe in Jesus Christ, if you're somebody who says, I believe in this, my Lord, then you have meaning. You have an identity because you are his. All of you who have been baptized, have been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are tied to the death and resurrection of Jesus. That makes you God's. And no matter what blessings might float away from you in life, whatever you might lose, you can't lose your identity in Christ if you believe in him. Because you are his. And that's something worth sharing and telling people. My last take home, I got three devotionals for us to deal with how do we share our identity with those outside. How do we help tell people who our Father is? All three come from the book of Colossians. Our first one deals with where we find our identity. In Colossians chapter 2, it ties in, we find it back in our baptism. Because we see it that we're tied to Christ. To Him, for what He's done. We get to hold on to that. But as we learn who we are, then it's important to live, to take time and grow and develop who God wants us to be. That's where our reading tonight comes into play. Our reading tonight reminds us the importance of putting away our, wor our worldly things to keep our eyes on Him. And when we spend that time growing and learning in Christ, there's one thing we can't hide then, our identity. At the end of Colossians, we find out that we simply just have to go out there and have a conversation with people. Not to tell people what they're missing out on, but simply to tell them who we are. Where we find our identity. And as we go through these devotions this week, I have a prayer for you. Every time you get done, take that time to say, my identity is found indeed in Jesus. Because no matter what, that's one thing we can take with us. Amen.